Unfortunately for the many, this fire begins to fizzle. <laughs> you know anybody, their fire has fizzled? Do we know each other good enough for me to be real personal with you this morning? Say yes. Has your fire fizzled? I'm Terry Knight, and the pastor here at New Life Community Church, and I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust, as always, that the Lord's going to bless you all over the place as we fellowship together here around the Word of God for the next several moments. We're going to begin a brand new teaching tonight. In fact, our text passage is from 2 Corinthians. It deals with the issue of repentance. Repentance. That seems to be a missing element in and around the church world and in and around the lives of people who are connected with the church or even hope to be connected with the church in this day and age. Again, the word repentance. We're going to explore that, see what the Bible has to say about that. Our text passage provides some, uh, some great insight. I want to begin with or put before you right now an additional uh, verse of Scripture. In fact, we're going to jump into these pretty quickly as we get into the teaching tonight. But if you would, go with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30. The record puts it this way. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. Let me do that again. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now He commands all people everywhere to repent. All people, everywhere. When the Bible says all people, you can know that's talking about you and myself. All people, everywhere, regardless of where they are, here, there, on this side of the world or the other side of the world, God has called for us to repent. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray and ask in Jesus' name that you would help us uh, for this particular teaching, to stay in your word. I pray for your anointing. I pray that you would anoint not only the speaker, but the ears of those that hear. And we'll thank you. We'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. I'll be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. God bless. One of the trends... I trust you understand trends that seems to be growing in this day and age is a noticeable absence. Now, sometimes it's hard to pick up on a noticeable absence, but there's this noticeable absence of the biblical command that is put forth over and over and over again in the New Testament. Now, we're going through a little drill here right at the outset of the message to see if you can discern what the Bible command or that theme is. And I'm going to restrict the T's to some references from what I refer to as the fifth gospel, the book of Action or the book of Acts. Three passages from Acts. We could have chosen more. But in chapter 3 and verse number 19, we read this. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. From who? From the Lord. A few chapters later, chapter 8 and verse number 22, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Different thing that prompted the repentance, but repentance nonetheless. Chapter 17 and verse number 30, we read, In the past, God overlooked, one version says, winked at such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Somebody tell me what the theme is. Say it out loud. 
repentance, the Bible command of repentance. If we go back into the Old Testament book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, you know, and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, God spoke to him. He spoke to the people. And here's what he said, actually captured the essence of what, uh, what repentance means. When he said, in chapter 55, verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his faults. There are two things addressed there. Look at that again. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Perhaps some more about that in just a few moments. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God and he will freely pardon. There's a lot in that verse. We'll just preach on that as a text one of these days. I want to call your attention once again to two key words in that verse, the word forsake and the word turn. You understand forsake? You understand turn? It's very important. Number one on your study notes, if you're new to new life, we actually fill these things in on Sunday morning. If you're really good... Are you with me? Here we go. Number one on your study notes, I believe this. I'm teaching this to you this morning. The biblical concept and the biblical doctrine or teaching of repentance is actually put before us as the way for us to live out the way we are to live out our Jesus walk, quote, unquote. In other words, it is to be a lifestyle. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's a lifestyle. A lifestyle. Now, I'll change gears just a little bit, but not much. Addressing the representative church of Ephesus, the era when the church was spiritually strong. It boasted of apostolic founding and was taught by the best possible leaders. Nonetheless, John reveals to us that that church digressed to this. And I'm in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4. He says this, Yet I hold this against you. What is it? You have forsaken, there's that word again, you have forsaken the love you had at first. And the first part of verse number five, he says, consider, consider how far you have fallen, repent, and do the things you did at first. Beloved, here in this particular passage, God speaks through John. We know him as John the Revelator, much alike he spoke through Isaiah the prophet, the very essence of what it means to repent. The essential things, think about that with me. Will you think essential for just a moment? The essential things we did at first as Jesus chasers, we find we are not doing them any longer. I'm going to pause for emphasis. The things we did at first as Jesus chasers, we find we aren't doing them any longer. The clear instruction from the Word of God is that we should resume doing those very things. But more than that, and I, this is a, just a, a minor detail in some respects, or at least it would appear as such. I'm not sure it is all that minor. But note with me again that John tells us in Revelation, repent and do the things you did. Here's my point of emphasis, and I'm headed to number two on your study notes. It's not just the outward doing the perfunctory, mechanical, following through that is the issue. Not just the outward doing that is the issue, but rather at issue is the heart. Everybody say heart. How many of you here this morning have a heart? Yeah, I thought there's a few of you. The at issue is the heart that serves to motivate the outward doing. Perhaps you've heard the story. That's a similar story in many respects about a fella who was faithfully attending church with his wife. 
What was he doing? <clears throat> Faithfully attending church with his wife, but he had dropped out of church. You want to know why? Say yes. Because he had opted to go fishing instead. But then all of a sudden, it seemed like one Sunday, he reappeared with his wife, and the pastor was just elated and privately conveyed to him how pleased he was to see him back with his dear wife who had remained so faithful. The one-time backslider, let me do that again, the one-time backslider said, well, preacher, it's like this. It's a matter of choice. And the preacher pressed in a little bit, and the gentleman offered, I'd rather hear your sermon than hers. Now listen, this guy had checked the outward box, but I want to suggest to you his heart wasn't running on all eight cylinders. Can I get an amen right there? His reasoning was skewed. Now here's a simple question. What sort of things did we do at first? Revelation 2 says, consider and do the things you did at first. What are those things? The Bible doesn't lead us to guess about those things. The classic example is portrayed in Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to ask you to turn over there with me right now. Acts chapter 2, uh, picking up with verse 42, a familiar passage to any Bible student, and most people have been in church any time at all. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It puts it this way. All the believers, how many? Do you believe that? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and devoted themselves to fellowship and devoted themselves to sharing in meals. This version adds in parentheses, including the Lord's Supper or communion, and devoted themselves to prayer. Look at verse 44. And all the believers, how many of them? All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. How cool is that? Look at verse 45. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Verse 46. They worshiped together at the temple, the Jewish temple. This was evangelistic work. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. That is a picture of what they were doing in the very beginning. This is foundational in understanding the New Testament church. They were devoted to the Word of God. They were devoted to the fellowship. That means the other members of the forever family of God. Devoted to them. Devoted to prayer. Not just this now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to sleep, or over the lips and through the gum, look out stomach, here I come. They were devoted to prayer. Devoted to benevolent care. I mean, they put their money where their mouth was. Devoted to worship and hospitality. Church, can you imagine that if even a fraction of the church world today, uh, let alone the, the community, if we would purpose to live by that purpose? Devoted to these things? Can you imagine what a difference it would make in our personal life, in our home life, in our church life, and among the, the larger community? Beloved, that's what a New Testament follower of Jesus looks like. Let me do that again. There's a lot of debate about that today. And I don't want to sound overly dogmatic to you this morning, but I'm not here to debate this with you. I'm here to read for you from the Word of God what is, and hopefully instead of bringing God down to your level, you'll try to come up to His. The New Testament follower of Jesus looks like someone that is devoted. If you can't say amen, say oh me. 
Now listen, my observation over the past five decades of pastoral ministry has confirmed this reality. The New Testament follower of Jesus, those who are born again and spirit-filled, I mean, they've got, they're the real deal. Those people are devoted. Number three on your study notes, when a heart or a life is transformed by the power of God. And think about that, church. Not somebody that just changes their mind, but a life that is transformed by the power of God, a life that which is described in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where one is made new by God's supernatural grace, that one's devotion to God things is paramount and present. It is observable. I believe that. For some, some, this never seems to diminish. Do you know of anybody that come to Christ, had the born-again experience, a testimony of being filled with the Spirit? They are quote-unquote on fire for God. It started decades ago, and they've never let up. Still have their foot on the gas, still devoted to all of these things we talked about. Their, their passion has not diminished one bit. For some, that is their testimony. Unfortunately, look at your neighbor and say, unfortunately. Now, don't look at them with an accusing, unfortunately. Unfortunately for the many this fire begins to fizzle. (laughs) You know anybody their fire has fizzled? Do we know each other good enough for me to be real personal with you this morning? Say yes. Has your fire fizzled? For many, the fire begins to fizzle after a few spiritual knocks and dings, a few trials and tribulations, a few days of realizing that it's not all going to be a bowl of cherries. It's not all going to be like Sunday morning worship. We could even say what I just described is somewhat normal, the fire fizzling, somewhat normal. But I want to suggest to you that normalcy is not what God has purposed. Let me do that again. That normalcy is not what God has purposed. God's Word emphasizes to us over and again, when you start to fizzle and you realize that you are fizzling, how many of you know when you're fizzling, you usually know it? You realize that you're fizzling. Don't settle for that continued downward trek. Well, pasta tea, what do we do about fizzling? Is there anything that can be done? Does CVS have anything for this? No, but God does have something for this. Here's what you do. This sounds like an old-fashioned message. By the way, I'm right on the verge of being old-fashioned these days. And if I'm accused of such, my response would probably be, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, old-fashioned works. Not in the terms of archaic legalism, in the terms of living out the eternal, precious promises of God. Here's what you do when the fire begins to fizzle. The same thing great, great, great grandpappy and all those in between did. Beloved, you need to yield to an altar of repentance. And let me remind you, as much as this altar means to us, and as much as we find God here, if you do do not bring your heart to this place, then you've just taken a, an unnecessary trip. Repentance begins where? In the heart. It's the heart where you feel the tug of God. It's the heart where that little string is connected that draws you to this place. Uh, an altar of repentance, and you repent of your sins. Why would you do that? Because Repentance, watch this, repentance serves as a point of intersection or the point of God's grace for us. Do you love those times when you meet God at the intersection of grace and mercy? You know what I'm talking about? As opposed to the intersection of death and destruction, 
Did you know that sin puts us at odds with our Heavenly Father? Now listen to me in particular, those of you that are watching by way of live stream, you may ne have never heard anything quite like this. There are movements of church groups today that pretty much just encourage you to live a lifestyle of sin. I do not believe that's biblical, and you're not going to hear that preached from here. Paul asked a simple question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What was the answer, church? So I don't have to comment on that, do I? I just want you to know and understand sin puts us at odds with our Heavenly Father. Repentance puts us back where we should be. What is it that puts us back? Is repentance important? It is if you want to be put back where you should be. Now, let me pause here. This is a little bit of a parenthesis, but I just want to say to you, and this is going to sound like an oversimplification. In fact, it sounds almost ridiculous, but that which necessitates repentance is sin. That's sort of what the, Paul was talking about with the Romans in chapter 6 and what necessitated that rhetorical question. Sin, that which necessitates repentance is sin. Now, the odds are very favorable that even sincere believers will meet with occasions where they mess up with a rousing amen. No, on second thought, just think about it. Did any of you mess up this week? Isn't it true that on occasion we mess up even the most sincere of believers? Friends, I wish that I could tell you this morning that human beings are as faithful and consistent as God, but that just is not true. We aren't. On occasion... Sin has this strange, unique effect upon persons, for it brings shame, and shame's first cousin, defeat. Shame, defeat, which quite promptly retreats on occasion. Shame brings defeat, and that defeat prompts retreat. Number four on your study notes, fill this in with me if you would, please. Rather than repent, many allow for their shame. Many allow for their shame to defeat them and send them into hiding or to, uh, to prompt them to retreat, as we said just moments ago. Beloved, the precedent, not president, but the precedent was established early on. I'm going all the way back to the book of Genesis. Even if you're new to the Bible, you should be able to find Genesis and chapter number 3 and verse number 8. Here's what we read. Then the man and his wife, make no mistake about it, that was Adam and Eve, the man and his wife, the picture of marriage. Can I get an amen right there? The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God. Let me stop right there. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Wouldn't you love to hear the sound of God? Now, I'm not sure what that sound is, but knowing God as I know God and how wonderful he is, how glorious he is to hear the sound of God, that must have been a really cool experience. It goes on to say they heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I told you this was cool. <laughs> That's funny right there. I don't care who you are. In the cool of the day. And look what it prompted them to do. They hid from the Lord God. You know why they did that. They did what God told them not to do. Listen to me. That is sin. When God says don't, and you say, hmm, I'm going to do it anyway, that is sin. To him that knoweth to do good, that which God has put forth and does it not, 
It is sin. So they hid from the Lord God. Look at this. I think this is very interesting. Look where they hid among the trees of the garden. Why would that be interesting? It's interesting because it was a tree that served as a catalyst for their shame in the first start. Are you with me? Now, I took you there to tell you this. How sad. Over the years, many years at this point for me personally, how sad it is to realize that we are missing persons from our own worship gatherings. And I'm not talking about a holiday weekend. We all know how that is. And I'm not talking about one service here and there. But how sad it is when we realize that we're missing certain persons from our own worship gatherings only to find out in time, one week, two weeks, three weeks, several weeks out to find that they have stumbled at some point and rather than face it, they either fake it Folks, we're going to wrap it up right there. Let me do so by asking you this. Have you messed up lately? In particular, those of you that are a part of the forever family of God, have you messed up? How do you deal with that? When you mess up, when you make a spiritual blunder, how do you deal with that? Do you just walk away, just forget about it? Walk away from the church to leave the church wondering what in the world happened? Or do you seek a deeper relationship with the Lord? Do you learn from that blunder and repent and seek to grow, to let your roots run down a little deeper instead of just running away? I really believe that's God's purpose and plan for all of us, that we grow. We're human beings, and I'm not making excuses for sin, but I'm telling you, people do people things. And when we do, we need to look to not other people, but to God who offers love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness. If you've fallen, I want to encourage you to look to God. Look to our Heavenly Father, and He is that. Some of you listening to me right now, you've never had an earthly father. You don't know what that looks like. Oh yeah, you had some male guy that perhaps brought you into this world, but you don't know what it means to have a real father. Can I encourage you to take a good long look at the Bible, the Word of God, in particular the New Testament, and realize what a loving, gracious Heavenly Father we have. Lord, I pray for each one listening in tonight, and I pray and ask in Jesus' name, by your word, that you would speak to those, in particular those who have fallen. Draw them back to yourself. May they know and understand who you are and the plan you have for their life, that you love them, you care about them, and you want to embrace them. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, before I get out of here, I do want to remind you that New Life Community Church has a regular schedule of activities Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We also have midweek activities Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. We'd love to see you for any and all of these activities. My time is gone. I have to get out of here. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church, wishing you a great week. And remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Is He coming back for you?